today's webinar with Alan Interactions, Resilience, a Lifelong Learning Journey. Kind of let people just kind of trickle in here. Um, please make sure that your panel is set from all panelists to switch it to all panelists and attendees when you're sharing your thoughts, your questions, um, insights, whatever from today that everyone can see them. My name is Carrie Zenz with Allen Interactions. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, just share and chat quick, you know, what the weather's like, where you're from. I'm in Southwest Minnesota. It's actually a beautiful day here today. I think it's chilly out, but it's sunny. We do not have any snow here right now, which is weird because we've had like two snowfalls, pretty substantial snowfalls, but it all melted. <laughs> Dreary in South Dakota. Oh, Tennessee. I love Tennessee. My, my family that lives in Nashville. Love it there. Minneapolis, that's where we're um, corporately located in St. Paul. So hi to Mary Beth and to Barb, Barb's in Roseville. Oh, I'm missing somebody else, Jolene. Oh, Kansas City, cool. Phoenix, oh, I love Arizona. Yes. Lovely, it's always fun to see where everyone's from. Madison, Wisconsin. It was Saudi Arabia. Wow. Um, I wonder what time it is there right now. I should probably know that, but I don't. <laughs> it's new central time here, so it's noon. All right. Well, we're going to, um, I think we're going to get started here. Again, this is um, Resilience, a Lifelong Learning Journey. Um, this is an hour-long webinar. This is part of our post-traumatic growth organizational transformation series that we've been doing. We did one webinar a few weeks ago. Um, we've been doing some other blogs around the topic, so we'll make sure we share that link to all of the resources around um, our series that we're doing. Again, my name is Carrie Zenz with Allen Interactions. Um, Allen Interactions' mission is to enhance the human mind and spirit through building um, meaningful, memorable, and motivational learning and performance experiences that optimize business performance. Um, so these are our services. We do a lot of things. Our we're really well known for custom development and e-learning design through our founder, my, um, Dr. Michael Allen. He's written a lot of books around that and done many talks and all kinds of things. Um, but we do a lot more than that. So those are all the services that are listed there on the screen. You can go out to our website and learn more about all of those whenever. Um, so we'll just uh, introduce here. These are our two um, wonderful um, speakers and colleagues from Allen Interactions. And they're gonna be, I'm gonna be turning things over to them, but just a little bit about them. Um, Dr. Christina Koidakis Bars, <laughs> I always fumble on that a little bit. She's an experienced HR learning and organizational change management expert. Um, she's a teacher, she's a professor. Professor, she, Her sweet spot is really in building systems that support, engage, and inspire cultures, building me measurable and sustainable results. And we also have Steve Larson here. He's a senior solutions architect with us, and he's a seasoned professional in um, sales leadership. He has a consulting background. Um, he's worked for some major Fortune 500 companies, and he has a focus in adaptive learning, change management, and problem solving. Um, so today, they're really going to be talking about building resilience. Um, this is a huge topic right now with everything that's gone on in 2020. And resilience really is about the ability to bounce back in life, in work, um, and this focuses on building that resilience across the, um, to covering that resilience across the entire continuum of learning from our first day of school to our last day of work. So I'm gonna turn things over to them. I do want everyone to know that today's session is being recorded. We'll be sending a copy um, of the recording link out to everyone. And again, to just please ensure that your um, setting is switched from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. And I'll switch, I'll turn things over to them. Welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's exciting to have you here. And uh, my name is Steve Larson, as mentioned, and I live in beautiful Salt Lake City. And I'm really happy to have all of you here. We have roughly 70 plus people on the, on the webinar today. So that's outstanding. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, this slide really just represents the first of our three webinars uh, in the series of post-traumatic growth. So just wanted to let you all know that we have uh, answered 
um, the bell and it's following up with some of the questions and responses that we had in the chat, were, which were fantastic. On the topic in webinar number two today on resiliency, and this uh, webinar number one is actually recorded, it's available to you. So I wanted to uh, throw out a chat question to kick things off. And uh, during this period of mask scale crisis, what are your organization's biggest resiliency challenges? And as Carrie kicked off the call and encouraged you to do, if you please in the chat, um, put attendees and panelists and please share your responses. We would love to uh, hear those. And obviously for those on the webinar, super beneficial to kind of get the ball rolling. So thank you for that. And um, we'll give you just a moment to put in your responses. Christine, anything you want to add to that? No, I'm actually reading that. Thank you. Uh, I'm reading uh, the challenges that people are having right now. And basically the feeling of disconnection, bringing an entire call center together that di um, disparately located uh, staffs is very frustrating. And it is. It, maintaining and we're actually starting to see a theme this is really good because we're going to talk about this through this uh this seminar today fantastic so i want to just cite the webinar goals and um actually christina this is really uh your baby so why don't you kick things off with our goals and then we'll transition so thank you everybody once again for your participation great and you can continue you know texting in the chat about ideas and challenges that you're having we um, have a great team with us that are scanning the chat for questions or ideas. And uh, as recently, we had a, a couple blogs that actually responded to questions that we didn't have time for last time. And we'll do the same this time as well, because our whole purpose is, is that we're better together, right? So our webinar today, the goals are, one is to understand the lifelong journey of resiliency building from you know, pre-K all the way through to the workplace. Um, and understand those themes. And now that's that's a lot to cover in you know, like 50 minutes, but we're gonna do our best. Uh, speak to the sharing of resiliency building education techniques for parents and learning professionals. So again, this is a highly interactive webinar. We're gonna be asking you guys questions and hoping for your responses so that we can make a better um, offering for you. We have a third webinar that will be coming up in uh, January, and it's about planning for post-traumatic stress and growth. So post-traumatic growth in 2021. Yes, we'll be happy we made it through 2020. And now how do we proactively plan and move forward? So a lot of the feedback we got from webinar one and, we and from this webinar will help inform us in webinar three. And then last, recognize real world examples of resilience. And Steve will be sharing a case study. Steve? Thank you very much, Christina. Well, this slide is a shocker and you may all be wondering what does Mexico and Idaho have in common? And for me, I wanna give you a personal case study to kick things off and really tee up Christina's fantastic content because truly uh, resiliency is learned from the first day of school to the last day of work. And really it's a lifelong skill we're continuously learning. You know, for me growing up in Salt Lake City, I always had the desire to uh, serve a, a church mission. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to do that. But before doing so, I had two main wishes. I would rather not go to Mexico. <laughs> and I would really not rather not go to Idaho, living in Utah. And uh, as I was growing up with a school teacher mother and uh, a father who was a civil structural engineer, you know, my mom had the summers off. And before the age of 19, I had the opportunity and privilege just to be a tourist and have the comfort of traveling to these amazing countries. And uh, you can see the last country listed is Mexico. So I thought, wow, um, you know, I saw the pyramids of Egypt and the poverty there. I saw the, uh, at the time in 1987 uh, when I went as a high school senior to Russia, the oppression of the Russian people in, in, in that country there. And there were so many things that were so beneficial, but I didn't experience these countries uh, as a native. I experienced them as a tourist. And so lo and behold, I get my call to serve a church mission in, lo and behold, Mexico. And so here I am, and I'm thrown to the wolves. Uh, and I, I'm really thinking to myself, wow, this, is, I, this isn't really like I imagined it as a tourist. <laughs> so right away, the skill set of resiliency and learning to adapt came really by force. And you can see the glass protruding from the wall. This is right in downtown Mexico City. 
there was graffiti on the wall and right behind me in that day's look as I'm about to turn on the water heater to uh, go into my cement floor garage to shower, I had to light the pilot in order to do that every single morning. And, they would have, and to make things uh, more interesting, there was no faucet for my shower. It was a straight stream right out of a cement wall that came shooting at me and I had to wear uh, flip-flops. And uh, it was very, very scary and different for me. And I really felt like this was going to be a challenge. I didn't know if I was going to be able to overcome. In fact, I went to my mission president and I went with my companion and said, I really don't think that I can do this. Someone's made a big mistake in sending me to the Spanish speaking mission. I struggled in high school and I just don't think this is for me. So he said, you know what? Why don't you go and sit in the lobby and I will make a few phone calls. So 50, I'm just it's so elated. I'm, I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm going to be able to, to leave this environment which I had to struggle with so much. Well, 15 minutes passed, I went back up and he says, you know what? I've tried for 15 straight minutes to try to get you transferred and I can get, not get anybody to answer the phone. I think we have our answer, get back to work. <laughs> and so I was so disappointed and I left that and I came to an area and this sweet family that you can see in front of you. And this is where the payoff of resilience really came into play. This, this lovely young uh, 80 plus year old woman in the orange apron invited me into her, her home. And I wasn't prepared for dirt floors and buckets for furniture. And to top things off, there was a wooden branch fence across their living room. And there was behind it of all things was a cow. Wow, I was not prepared for that either. Uh, I had to adapt, I had to really gather myself. But you know, when they, this, this payoff came very quickly because five minutes into our discussion, this woman in the orange apron stopped us in our tracks and says, listen, six months ago, I had a dream that you would come. And I sat up in my dream in my bed and looking me straight in the eye, she said, I saw you, Guero, you blonde haired, blue eyed American, helping me learn how to become rich in spirit. And so that was really life-changing for me and the resiliency factor paid off. And I went on to have some fantastic experiences. I had a lot of fun. I had my face smashed in my birthday cake, which I didn't realize was also <laughs> a tradition and something that I adapted to. And the irony of it was, is I went on to not only learn Spanish, but I learned it to a degree where I came home and had a hard time speaking English. And by the way, uh, as we were rehearsing, I had met at Christina asked me if uh, I was if I was a toothbrush. I assure you, it's not a cigar. <laughs> it was a toothbrush. I didn't have that much fun, but uh, but we had a great time and I had great success. Had a lot of companions, and I actually came to really use these adaptation skills to really bond myself to the Mexican people and families. And so, really, what I want to wrap up with is from the first day of school to the last day of work and really the last day of our lives. Resiliency plays such a major part in our job satisfaction. You know, the pandemic has forced all of us into this framework of really learning things we would not have experienced in our comfort zone. And so I'm really excited to turn the time over to Christina to walk you through strategies and tactics. And this last picture really is tender for me because five years after my mission, this great man to my left uh, passed away, my father. And these skills of resiliency really helped me adapt to that as well. No one's ever prepared for that either. And so please uh, give your attention to Christina as we'll help you with post-traumatic growth and how you can also apply these in your everyday life. Christina, over to you. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that's a, a very poignant and meaningful story. And in resilience, that's one of the things is finding meaning in the things that happen uh, around us and to us. So before we even start uh, with the, my portion, I'm gonna ask Rich to put up uh, the first poll um, and just basically uh, answering each one of these questions on a Likert scale of uh, one strongly disagree to five strongly agree. And we'll just wait and let you all um, uh, answer those. And so we can kind of level set and see where everyone's mind is at.
We've got 81 people on the line who are doing a fantastic job, Christina. That's great. I love watching the things bounce back and forth. It's kind of like watching the little running man on you know, <laughs> wall or, or that little circle that goes when things are buffering. Oh, someone says that the submit button is, doesn't seem to appear to work. We're at 60%, so I will end. That's excellent. And, uh, and I love the fact that everybody came together and helped uh, others who didn't understand how to scroll down. So that's perfect. So let's see, what do we have here, Steve? Um, I have a solid plan for building my resiliency capability. And we have, a, um, we have agree is the part that came out the, uh, with 37%, just closely behind with an undecided. So. In, time, in the times that we're going with COVID and civil unrest and all the politics and the issues that are going on right now, even some of the plans that we used to have may not be working, that's understandable. So let's see, what's our next one? Organization has a resiliency and wellness plan in place. So the we got a disagree for 33% of the people um, responding and strongly agree only 2%. Um, Great opportunity in this call to really help with that. Exactly, exactly, especially at our call to action later at the end. And Steve will explain more about that. And then resiliency building is overrated. Yes, you all are at the right workshop. Strongly disagree, thank you very much. Um, and then resilience should be part of a standardized curriculum. Uh, strongly agree. Again, you guys are all at the right, you're, you're in the right workshop, yay. Thank you very much. And. Um, one of the people asked is like, uh, will the results of this particular poll be shared? And do we capture that and able to share it? Carrie and Claire? Yeah, I was going to do a, a, a screenshot of that, so. Okay, we'll great. All right, so, um, you know, with resiliency, uh, there's, th there's three parts this, to our our uh, webinar today. Uh, we are doing a series on organizational trauma and post-traumatic growth. When we did our first uh, series, people came back and said, what about resilience? Because you, know, you have perseverance. So perseverance, there's a difference between perseverance, resilience, and post-traumatic growth. So perseverance is being able to power through something when you have a difficulty, just to work your way through it. That's, um, for example, you're at the checkout counter and you've got um, the person in front of you has 35 items and it's 10 items or less line. So you've got to power through it. Or you're trying to check out of hotel.com and they keep trying to add things like your Hertz rental car and stuff. And all you just want is a room. That's perseverance. That's, that's powering through and having the ability to handle that difficulty. Now, resilience is being able to handle or with, uh, withstand the stress and then to bounce back. And bouncing back means coming back to the original mi uh, mental mindset that you had and um, still healthy, still strong. I'm gonna read the, um, the definition by the American uh, Psychological Association of what resiliency is. So it's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress such as family and relationship problems, even serious health problems or workplace and financial stressors. So that's the resiliency simply said is the ability for someone to make it to, to deal with that issue and then to come back to their original mindset. Now, post-traumatic growth is that when the incident that you're going through, the trauma that you're going through exceeds the resilience that you have, the ability, because you have a capability of resilience and you can rebuild and replenish your, res your resilience. But let's say you've expanded that, you're in war and torn uh, country, you're dealing with COVID-19, your children are home while you're also trying to, uh, to work. Those are traumatic experiences, not saying that your children are not well behaved, I'm saying that the challenges can be very traumatic. And when you go through a traumatic experience 
of, um, of a physical or violent nature or an incredibly intense mental uh, dissociation, what happens is that as you go through it and your mind starts to process that information, you actually come out on the other side with new skill sets. Now, I'm not gonna say better because we're still the same person. We just now have a new and different perception and skill sets to be able to now be resilient towards the world. So that's post-traumatic growth. And we will be talking more about post-traumatic growth in our webinar number three and how we can help organizations go through this with their trauma, assessing their trauma, and then doing that post-traumatic growth. So during this webinar, we said we promised highly interactive and also we would be remiss in not helping people with their resiliency building. So we're gonna have three mindful moments during this um, uh, webinar and the mindful moments, we're just going to be providing you some free resources that are out there to help you hit that reset button and replenish your, res your resiliency. So the first one is pixel thoughts. Now pixel thoughts um, is a 60 second focused meditation. And what you do is, and you can see this uh, screenshot on the right hand side, you would put what is frustrating you in that bubble. And then when you hit start, the bubble with music and with a guided meditation, the bubble gets smaller and smaller and finally disappears. And it's 60 seconds. And it just gives you that ability to let go and leave it. Um, all of these resources that we're providing today are in a document that Claire Letts has uploaded into the chat. So you'll have all the links to all the resources that we're providing. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So edu ooh, ooh. Uh, education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. I mean, that's the appropriate uh, quote for lifelong learning. Now with the COVID-19 and all the stressors of trying to be fully present um, in school, in work, at college, there's been a lot of challenges with learning and growing. And it's difficult to learn and grow when you're in a, uh, a flight or fight mode. When you're highly stressed, it's difficult because you're, right now your brain is in an amygdala jet hijack. You've gone back to the caveman thought process of I need to outrun that saber toothed tiger and survive. And when you're surviving, you're not thinking about how your pre-calculus test is going or how your math tables are doing or anything or like how you're going to meet that deadline. You're at the point where you need to be able to survive and then eventually thrive. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, you know, you hear a lot about um, the future of work and where the future of work is. Well, the future of work are our students. They're our children. They're the people that are going to school right now. And, you know, with being good global citizens and global uh, digital citizens in the world, understanding um, the ability to be nimble, to flex, and to be able to help with moving forward. So that would be the next slide. There we go, the real future of work. Um, and basically it's the digital era. And not only are we trying to help our students understand the content and the context of their education and curriculum, but it's also the delivery. And thinking about this past year in 2020, we went from instructor led to in one week going into digital driven or computer-based training and education for at across all levels of education. So even though it was uh, difficult and stressful, it was teaching um, our students how to be nimble, how to uh, adapt and to shift their uh, focus and their ability to consume information. So um, I just love this picture because we're going to, we're going to survive and we're going to thrive. Now my next I image is the continuum of lifelong learning. So you can see there's the there's a lot to try to cover in 50 minutes. So we're going to be doing just like, you know, a very high level in each one of these. Now, if there's a part where there's um, questions about any one of these doc uh, of these sections, we can answer them in um, a follow up um, video interview or in a blog. So we're looking at pre K. Um, elementary and high school for the uh, for purpose of today, we're going to 
collect elementary and high school into K through 12. Then we're at college, um, colleges and university adult education, and then workforce development, and then um, leadership development. And thinking about these are the things that right now people go through in their continuum of learning in order to grow and develop, how they're being measured, some of the delivery and the modalities that they're experiencing. We're gonna revisit this particular slide later on and overlay what resiliency practices we're gonna discuss during this webinar. So for pre-K, you know, there's a lot of um, challenges happening with pre-K. And what I'm gonna stop right there, I'm gonna ask uh, Rich to add yet another poll. We have another poll. And this poll right here is, um, you know, basically we're asking uh, what, um, what you're, the purpose of developing your resilience, what is motivating you to build your resilience. So before we even start, you know, focusing on pre-K through leadership development, let's get your uh, thoughts on what's motivating you. And you could pick all that apply um, and uh, let's watch and see how we're getting, stress and anxiety is a big one, yeah. What do you think, Steve? Steve, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I had an awesome <laughs> comment. Um, no, I was saying that <laughs> reducing anxiety by far, I think for most and reducing stress are the top two for sure. And we got, oh wow, we got almost three quarters of the people answering for this. And increase, I think is a close, uh, improving performance and increasing happiness. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the happiness piece. Um, when we talk about um, Martin Seligan and uh, the um, uh, Flourish and his uh, PERMA model on wellness and well being. So thank you very much for that. And we're gonna go right into pre K. So little children, big challenges. So there's a, I, I found this really fantastic resource called From Neurons to Neighborhoods, The Science of Early Childhood Development. It's very big and a lot of information. But what I really liked about the little snippets that I caught was that it's development is developing the whole child. It's not just the, the skills of the alphabet, literacy, math, et cetera, but it's actually teaching them the ability to, um, have a resilience and you may you know you may be teaching your children resilience and not even realizing that you're doing it and you know, pre-k resilience involves a working memory you know how you do those matching uh games with your child um the ability to focus on a goal um, that may be uh finishing a task or playing a game outside tolerance for frustration and i think that is a um a resiliency uh, lesson that we have to learn throughout our entire lives and then controlling and expressing our emotions in an appropriate way and that's self-regulation and there's different ways to do self-regulation so again we promised that we would share you know we have a short period of time share some resources that may be able to help or augment so the uh, resource that i found that i was really pleased to find was um sesame street sesame street actually has um a skill uh, a resiliency toolkit and it's free and it has games, videos and art. So you'll notice like games, video and art, they're very visual, they're um, highly creative, they're curious. I mean, children ask an enormous amount of questions and it's there's a huge drop off between the age of five and the age of six for the amount of questions they ask because they have this high level of curiosity. And the idea is that we wanna capture that curiosity and that creativity and help them bring it along through your entire life because those curiosity questions will help them with innovation and problem solving later in life. So these are this particular toolkit. So chat questions are, what are some resiliency activities that you've tried with your kids or friends have tried with their kids? So we'll just let you answer that in the chat. Steve, one of my favorite is um, uh, Simon Says, because it teaches self-regulation. For sure. Uh, 
I think, um, I don't know if I'm Twister qualifies, taste. but that's a fun one. Being patient is a struggle. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Breathing, huge. That's excellent. Discussing quietly and learning your, using your indoor voice. Emily, I love your answer on giving them responsibilities. That is a big one at the young age. Reading books, playing games, taking a break and doing something different to redirect the energy. Perfect, Leslie. Fantastic. And you're seeing that, are you seeing like some of the themes that what we're teaching our children are actually the resiliency themes that we would be using as adults? Uh, games and reading, excellent novelette. Joe, I love your still game. That's a fantastic one. Who can be quiet and still the longest? I love that. Excellent. I use that with my nieces and nephews. <laughs> it brings me peace. Yes, very good. Uh, excellent. Let them struggle through age non-age appropriate things to learn to understand frustration have goals, self-regulate, and push through. Excellent. That teaches them perseverance and resilience. Yep, not reacting and giving space. Fantastic, Ailey. See, and all of these things that you're teaching them are guiding them to be fantastic leaders. And you'll see that at, later on in, in this presentation. So let's go on to our next part, which is K through 12. Now remember, on K through 12, we bucketed elementary, middle school, and high school together just for the for the sake of time. But for every one of these buckets, there's an enormous amount of information that's out there on education, on resiliency and enhancing curriculum. So in K through 12, when doing our research on finding a very good example of an organization that has embedded um, resilience into their curriculum as well as um, positive psychology is KIPP. Now KIPP is uh, Knowledge is Power program. KIPP is a cha uh, charter school program. It's been around for about 25 years. And one of the things it follows is the theory that it's character, not cognitive, that builds that growth mindset, the perseverance and resilience. So, you know, on the growth mindset, that is Carol Dweck's uh, concept of having an open mind, uh, looking at things positively, having an asset-based um, approach, uh, not deficit-based thinking. Uh, thinking about perseverance, that is Angela Duckworth's grit, um, how much uh, you power through, how much you can be scrappy towards. That's a very good book to read. And resilience. And you'll see their character, that report card. Now, what's important about this is because we're giving that feed forward to the, to the student. And I talk about feed forward as opposed to feedback. Feedback, uh, when people hear feedback, they think of being, uh, you know, walking down a dark alley and somebody's coming up behind them. The idea of feed forward is that there's better possibilities. You're not having the shame or the guilt that you didn't do something right. What you're looking at a situation and saying, what could you do the next time? This is what you did right. And these are the opportunities to move forward. So in giving that feed forward, the KIPP character report card, as you look at the KIPP character report card, you can see zest grit that we were talking about, that perseverance. And then self-regulation, that's under student work and interpersonal, that self-control. Then optimism and gratitude really falls under, and curiosity falls under Peterson and Sullivan's Character Strengths and Virtues. And that's a fantastic book. And in that book, it has a thorough understanding of all the different virtues and strengths that you can measure uh, through a validated um, tool and then be able to identify gaps and then grow and develop. Um, Sutherland's really known for being the grandfather or the father of positive psychology. He wrote a book about happiness and then eventually uh, about well being and thinking about more about overall, we should address people, not just pursue happiness, but pursue a balanced existence and being fully present is what will help us with building our resilience. So that's the, um, the KIPP character charter. There's also a little bit in here where you'll see about um, uh, social relationships and everything that goes into emotional intelligence, which is also boyatsis and thinking about how do you grow your social um, uh, relationships and your social awareness. Now going into college and university. So now we've gone through, you know, pre-K and Sesame Street 
looking at what the growth is for K through 12. Now you've graduated and you've gone into um, onto your campus, whether it's online or it's um, in person. Uh, and especially right now with COVID, there's been a lot that's changed with college and universities. And that's usually a big stressor time um, as you're challenging, you're changing. Sometimes you're going for the very first time away from home, like Steve was sharing when he went for his mission. And that's when you, uh, where people actually make that distinction in becoming their own human being. Now there's a lot of stressors with that. I'm gonna share you some stats. Um, so in college and universities, now this is some of these stats are even before COVID. So this is what's very enlightening. 30% increased counseling of the counseling center use on um, campuses from 2009 to 2015. And then 25% of college students report diagnosis of or treatment of a mental illness. That's one in four, and that's in 2018. And then you can see this uh, from the Pew Research Center that the future students, the people that are coming up into college and why colleges have to be more prepared more than ever said that 70% of them viewed anxiety and depression within their peers. And then um, there's another study because I went back trying to find something that's a little bit more recent. And in 2019, there was a study that was conducted and um, over 200,000 students, 163 campuses, and the directors of counseling centers for these college campuses said they 90% of them had experienced an uptick in the use of uh, the counseling services, which means that the stigma of mental health has gone away, but it also means that there's a, a call to action for resiliency building. So some schools have made those strides and we're gonna share two uh, examples. Uh, the first example is the University of Southern California. They have a Thrive Foundations for well, of Wellbeing course that they offer and um, uh, they'll eventually be making it as part of freshman orientation. And then the University of Dayton has gone one step further and created a culture of caring or a culture of care. And they have mental health, health awareness module that's part of their orientation that's mandatory. And they also are teaching mental health first aid. So what's mental health first aid? Well, I'm gonna show you. So mental health first aid actually builds on those three, the three R's, the new three R's of writing, re, um, writing reading and resilience. Steve, why don't we show the next slide? So mental first aid, and I really love this graphic because sometimes first aid isn't a bandage, isn't CPR or the Heimlich maneuver or even calling 911. Sometimes the first aid is you. It's being a peer and being there for others. Now, remember earlier when we talked about resiliency was connections. So that's part of it, it's being the connection. Now, mental first aid, actually um, here in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, we did a study where uh, the, bar, uh, the local barbershop uh, school called uh, No Grease uh, was all of their barbers and hairdressers were taught uh, mental first aid. And because in communities, especially in the, um, in the underserved communities, the one place that, they, that people go consistently is to their barber. And they had that long relationship and connection. So the barbers were all taught on uh, mental first aid. So as they're helping and they're seeing their patrons, you know, week after week, month after month, they can notice if there's some changes and then also immediately provide guidance in a psychologically safe environment. So um, in those resources that Claire had uploaded in that document, there's a, a link to uh, mentalfirstaid.org and more of information about this eight hour course that's available that they're teaching on campuses now, but a lot of hospitals are utilizing it now and other organizations. Hey, just very quickly, Christina, I got a text from my barber speaking of right after I left and he actually thanked me for being his armchair psychologist. He's there doing that all day for others, but I tell you, in the pandemic, we never know who needs us to be their mental first aid. So Amelia Silva really uh, appreciated your comment that the first aid is you. Ah, that's excellent. Thank you. So here's our mindfulness moment number two, as promised. So this is um, a web, um, a page, it's called Do Nothing for Two Minutes. That sound luxurious? It's by Khan. 
Uh, and what it is is that you go onto the website and you click start and it does a countdown for two minutes and you cannot touch anything. Don't touch your mouse, don't touch the keyboard, don't touch anything. You have to stay still and not touch anything electronic and just watch the screen and listen to the waves. However, if you do touch something, it stops and you see that image to the side, it turns red and says, try again, no judgment, just try again, you failed, let's try again, and you restart. Now, why is this important? Well, there's a book called Time to Think. And in that book, it talks about how in our neural pathways, it takes two minutes for an information to pass through a fully formed idea. You ever, um, you know, Steve, you ever talking to somebody, having a conversation, and then somebody interrupts you while you're in mid thought. And then after they're done, they, you go, they said, go ahead, Steve, go. And you're like, I don't know, because the train left the station, right? Yeah, your train of thought went because you were actually in that two minute zone. So this mindful moment, what's fantastic about this is it really, it legitimately gives you that time, that reset button, two minutes, you're worth two minutes. So, you know, think about that. We have that pixel thoughts, it's one minute, but here's this thing right here, that's two minutes. If you're going through a difficult day or you have to stop just before you go to do, I don't know, a webinar and you want to be able to reset, this is a fantastic tool. Uh, next. So workforce. So we've talked about pre-K, we talked about uh, K through 12, um, college and how to prepare through college, especially through COVID right now and how we're developing relationships, self-awareness, wellness, health. What are the next things to do in your workforce? So let's uh, go on to the next page. So I really liked this particular image because this particular image really gives you an idea of the potential for detrimental outcomes, like the potential for things to go wrong or for burnout as it goes from low to high. And then the bottom axis is the resources required to mitigate that um, potentially bad outcome. Now we all have bad, you know, good and bad stress. Now good stress, good stress is media deadline or, um, you know, uh, trying to make it home during traffic and it's frustrating, or you have a goal or, and you wanna make that goal. That's good stress and we all have good stress in our lives. Um, the next part is, is the tolerable stress, you know, the stress that we get that's kind of bad, but it's like, it's okay. Because again, remember we talked about perseverance and resilience. That perseverance and resilience is that part that helps us get through that tolerable stress. But if it's not mitigated correctly, it risks going into toxic stress. And toxic stress is when it starts to uh, manifest itself in anxiety, depression, and other physical illnesses. In workforce, you'll see people not um, uh, an increase of uh, absenteeism or missed deadlines or a drop in productivity. And then when you go up into overload, that portion is right there is when you start risking uh, compassion fatigue, uh, burnout um, and people either quitting or leaving their jobs. So what are some of the things that you can do to help with mitigating that? Um, go back one. Oops, sorry, Christina. It's okay. Um, so foster a sense of belonging. So that's employee engagement. And you know, you, when you have those employee engagement, this is where employee engagement is really critical right now because it's becoming a measure and a pulse to see where your employees are at. Whether you're using a net promoter score, employee net promoter score, or you're using a very complex uh, instrument to measure employee engagement, now is the time to really understand where their thoughts and hearts are. And being inclusive in that development Practice the four W's of trauma-informed communication during crisis for your organization. Right now we are in crisis, it's a mass scale crisis. So thinking about the why, the what, the where, and the uh, when. We actually have a blog on that and we covered those four W's in webinar one. And then acknowledge that trust is the stabilizer in unstable environments. When we make a connection as leaders, because most often, when we're in the middle of this crazy world that we're in and all the difficult circumstances as a leader or just as a human being, we're going to gravitate towards the tangible things that we can do. We're gonna to gravitate towards the tasks that we can cross off, the things that we can control. The problem is, is that when we put our head down to go and do that, we disconnect from those around us. So the, the idea is understanding that connecting with your 
um, employees, with your teams and with your peers helps to continue that trust that you're there for them. And that creates that level of consistency and stability, especially in the unstable world. And modeling that behavior as a leader, being transparent, empathetic, and authentic. Now, when we were, um, here's mindfulness number three, we promised three. This third one is also free. And what it is, um, is a, um, a tool that you can bring your team together in circles to do mindful activities. It's either to watch a small talk about leadership hacks or it's to do a group meditation. And it's been found that group meditation helps bo boost trust and productivity and resilience. So that's the third one. And of course, you can see a couple of screenshots from that particular app. It's a mobile app. It also has a web-based um, interface. And that uh, link is also in that res um, resources that we shared earlier. And then when I was looking at trying to find uh, resources for, um, for workforce, uh, we automatically went into leadership. So let's take the next one. So here's a chat question. What strategies or tactics have you found successful to foster resiliency in your workforce? So we've shared quite a different, different ideas from pre-K all the way up that can actually, like adult coloring books, we talk about pre-K doing coloring and creativity. We're also talking about what can we do as adults? What can you do in your workforce? So let's see what people have in our chat about what strategies or tactics that you would like to share with the others that are on this webinar. Ah, uh, Carrie, I use Calm too. I love that. Checking in with others is big. That's a great one, Leslie. This is the time to use your network. Um, even street, uh, you know, like when you do light, the, the um, tool, that mindful moment tool number three, when um, there's that part where you can do a sling or Netflix and you could do um, group viewing or streaming of a movie or a series together. That's ba basically the same thing as connecting and feeling um, that there's something outside you and that you're part of something greater than yourself. Let's go to the next slides. As it keep going, keep, keep adding, because we're gonna share all of this information with everybody that is participating on this webinar. So we're gonna go into leadership and I'm just gonna power through these last couple of slides so you can have time to share your case study. So leaders holding space, I really love this Booker T. Washington quote. I love, I have learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position one has reached in life, but as the obstacles overcome while trying to succeed. And boy, 2020 has made us all fantastic at reaching those obstacles and powering through and having the resiliency and also the post-traumatic growth that will result in the years after as we reflect on all the things that we've experienced, like what uh, Steve shared with us and how he grew and he developed over to the point that um, you know, his mind actually was thinking in Spanish. It is amazing how our bodies can be so resilient and so strong and so powerful. So the slides, the next slides I have, uh, one is being aware of the apathy to empathy uh, continuum. You know, apathy is I don't care um, and uh, it's not important to me that others are in pain. Sympathy is I feel sorry for those that are in, um, in pain. Tell me about it, I feel sorry for you. But you can see there's no connection there. Compassion is I feel for you, I do care. And then empathy is I stand with you. I will walk with you through this pain. So empathy is being together. Or So as a leader, we wanna be cognizant of when we're human, when we're powering from empathy to apathy, maybe compassion, sympathy, and being cognizant of where we are thinking, what our mindset is. So when I was looking at all the different um, programs that are out there, and there's so much, I figured I need to, I should share at least one model with you. And this is from Wharton on um, leadership resilience called Real. And it's relationships, efficacy, positive affect, and learning. Let's go into the next slide. 
This gives you a little bit more. And relationship is to be engaged, motivated, and supported by others. And exactly what you all were sharing in there about connecting, reaching out, and you know, being part of your, your network, using your neighbors, using your family. Efficacy is having goals. Remember we were talking about how back in pre-K, we were teaching about goals and being able to achieve goals, goals and confidence to reach them. Positive affect is that growth mindset that we talked about several times with um, Carolyn Dewick about that. And the last one is leadership and le um, learning. And that's uh, learning from our mistakes and growing and developing from them. So we're gonna skip this chat question, Steve, and go right into your case study. I mean, this right here, um, just go back one. And this is just the continuum of resiliency learning. So this is taking everything that we discussed earlier and overlay it into resiliency learning. And we're gonna do a blog on this particular slide and giving you a little bit more detail about it. So um, I, because I really want Steve to share his case study. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Christina, great job. So I wanna to talk to you about NAMI, which is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization. And they are a customer of Allen Interactions. And they're dedicated to building better lives and for the most vulnerable populations, which are those with mental illness. And we're all affected by uh, the in-person training that Christina talked about pre-pandemic. And this population in particular needed a, some special uh, customization to meet their needs. Uh, the parents or guardians of these uh, children with mental illness were not able to attend and for that reason, we needed to create a, a host of flexible e-learning uh, experiences and connection. And primarily, as Christina mentioned, empathy for this population. So this is really the, the challenge and opportunity that we faced. And so what we did is we customized these content options, as I mentioned, and we specifically focused on the participants and to fit both the child and parent by focusing on competencies and skill development and also taking a blended learning approach. Number two, we wanted to ensure that the participants had the ability to connect and share the way they genuinely wanted to, to have that genuine connection. And so we focused on social and collaboration. And finally, number three, we wanted to record multiple videos to really provide that learning strategy behind offering instructor-led training virtually uh, and having those videos available online. And by doing these three things to really meet NAMI's needs for the special population, the result was award-winning. It was fantastic to be able to help these, this population of children and their parents uh, be able to learn in such a way remotely that enabled NAMI to be nominated for multiple awards, which really focused again on competency and skill development, the ability to have the right technology and also blend the right learning for these, the special population and their caregivers. And then finally to use the best social and collaborative learning efforts. So at Allen Interactions, as Christina mentioned from the top of the uh, webinar, we not only have been known as in, uh, from our content development from Dr. Michael Allen and all of the great methodologies that have been proven over time, but we also can do now something uh, very uh, beneficial for you and your organizations. Before I get to the opportunity that is free from myself and my colleagues here, I want to just touch on some key points. Number one, in this webinar, we explore the lifelong journey of resilience building from preschool to graduate school in the workplace. So I'm, we're optimistic that, and we appreciate the positive comments that you found this beneficial. Number two, we shared resilience building with educational techniques and for parents uh, which I appreciate as a parent of four children as well, and, uh, and the learning professional audience that we have on this webinar. And finally, uh, I just described the NAMI case study and the award-winning ability uh, that we provided this uh, special population of mentally ill children to be able to build resiliency. So at Allen, we do three things extremely well. We help transform and provide this resiliency factor and adaptive learning methodologies through people like Christina and a panel of other PhDs that help with people process, uh, process and technology. So with the acquisition of problem solutions in 2019, 
uh, we're able to now do what many firms cannot do, which is to support all three legs of the stool, which is pretty exciting. And we offer a free 90 minute workshop to do this. So I would encourage you, I would invite you to connect with me and or Alan on our website. Uh, my email address is slarson with an E at alani.com. And we'll walk you through nine different segments of your ecosystem environment that we can then back into, like we did with NAMI, different solutions that can really capitalize on your strengths as well as close gaps and make your organization more resilient. As you remember from the poll question, that was one of the things that you all said in your participation that was probably a big need, which is how do we get resiliency built into our organization? And we're doing that really, really well with Fortune 500 companies down to startups. And we're really excited to have that opportunity. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Christina, for one more thing. Yes, one more thing. So I, I think Colombo used to say that, right? I'm aging myself. Okay, so um, one more thing. Start 2020 with a growth mindset, thinking about all the opportunities and possibilities, having an asset-based uh, approach. That doesn't mean that we don't focus on what happened. Of course, we're going to be looking at that and thinking about what went well, what didn't go so well, and what should we start, stop, and continue. So what we'd like you to do and invite you is to register for the third of our series, Planning for Organizational Post-Traumatic Growth. Um, that will be on January 13th, 2021. What a great way to start the year is with Allen Interactions. When you register, you'll receive an email with a worksheet to fill before the event so that we can hit the ground running. And again, be highly interactive and walk away with hopefully meaningful and memorable um, information. So thank you again for joining us, Steve. Yes, thanks once again, everybody. We, uh, we wanna give some time back to you and uh, we really look forward to having you in our January third and final webinar. You don't wanna miss it. And in the meantime, thanks again and happy holidays. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.